Hello and welcome to the fourth video in the second module of our statistics videos. In this video we're going to be examining the different shapes that graphs can have and then we'll be creating a very easy type of graph called a dot plot. Let's get started. Now the shape of a graph is an important feature because it can give us important information about patterns that are in the data. The shape will also tell us whether or not it is appropriate to perform certain analyses on the data. For example, the techniques that we used in the last couple of modules are only appropriate for graphs that fit what is called the normal distribution. In this video, we're going to examine five different shapes that a graph might have. This doesn't mean that these are the only shapes that a graph can have, but these are some of the more common shapes that you're going to see. For the first shape, we're going to examine this purple graph on the left. The type of graph that we're looking at here is called a histogram, and we'll be talking about how to make histograms in videos 6 and 7 of Module 2. The most striking feature about this graph is that it's really tall in the center, so the tallest bars are in the center of the graph. And as you move away from the tallest bars, each side has bars that are approximately the same height. They're not perfectly the same, but that's okay. They should be pretty close. When this happens, we say that the distribution is approximately symmetric. In other words, if we were to fold this graph down the center, then each of the two sides would meet up perfectly or almost perfectly. So now let's examine some other approximately symmetric graphs. This type of graph is called a dot plot, and it's the graph that we'll be making towards the end of this video. A graph like this is called a box plot. We're going to make box plots in the third module, and this third type of graph is called a stem and leaf plot. Now, each of these three graphs is approximately symmetric, because if we were to fold it down a center line, the two sides would be approximately the same. Same thing for the box plot, as well as the stem and leaf plot. So if we were to fold any of these three graphs down the center, the two sides would meet up almost exactly. The second shape is a little bit different from the first one. We once again have a really tall bar, but this time the left and the right edges are not exactly the same. On the left hand side of the tall bar, we have six bars that kind of decrease as we move to the left. And I didn't miscount, there are actually six bars here. Remember when we made our frequency distribution, we needed to include a category even if the frequency is zero. So that little blank space that's been left there is a bar that has a frequency of zero. If I look at the bars to the right of that tall bar, there are only three of them. Now the bars to the left and to the right of that center tall bar are called the tails of the graph. So this graph has a longer tail on the left because there are six bars on the left and a shorter tail on the right because there are three bars on the right. When the longer tail is on the left hand side of the graph, we say that the graph is skewed left. So, once again, let's examine three other types of graphs, and each of these is also skewed left. For the stem and leaf plot, the top of the graph corresponds to the left, and the bottom of the graph corresponds to the right. So if we look at the tail on the left of the stem and leaf plot, and compare it to the tail on the right, the tail on the left is much longer. Similarly, in the dot plot, the tail on the left is again much longer than the tail on the right. And if we look at the features on the box plot, you'll notice that the yellow box and that long line there are much more drawn out or wider than the yellow box and the line on the right hand side. So each of these is skewed left because it's stretched out longer on the left hand side than it is on the right hand side. This graph has kind of the opposite shape of the previous one. On this graph, the left-hand tail is only three bars, while the tail on the right is made up of six bars. So when the tail on the right-hand side is longer, we're going to call the graph skewed right. So to determine the direction of the skew, you want to see where is the longer tail, where is it more stretched out. This doesn't mean to look for where the taller bars are. In fact, usually it's where most of the shorter bars are. So you want to look for how, how stretched out it is on the left, or how stretched out it is on the right. If it's more stretched out on the right-hand side, then the graph is skewed right. Once again, let's look at three other graphs that are skewed right. On the box plot, notice that the left-hand side is more condensed than the right-hand side. 
Since the right hand side is more stretched out, this box plot is skewed right. Similarly, in the dot plot, the tail on the left hand side is shorter than the tail on the right hand side. And in our stem and leaf plot, the tail on the left or the top is much shorter than the tail on the right, or in this case on the bottom. So all three of these graphs are also skewed right. This fourth shape is different from the first three because it doesn't have just one tall bar or a couple tall bars that are right next to each other. In this graph, we have two distinct tall bars. In addition to that, if we look at the bars that are surrounding the two tall bars, it kind of looks like our data is falling into two groups. So when you have data that seems to be falling into two distinct groups, we say that that graph is bimodal. So here are two other bimodal graphs. You can see the two separate clusters in our dot plot, one on the left and one on the right. And similarly, we have a distinct cluster in our stem and leaf on the top and on the bottom. So when you have two separate groups in one graph, the graph is going to be called bimodal. Our fifth and final graph shape is kind of boring, which makes it sort of weird. In this case, all of the bars have the same frequency. When this happens, when all of the bars are the same height, we say that the graph is uniform. Kind of like if you have a group of people wearing a uniform, they all pretty much look the same. So in a uniform distribution, all the bars are the same. And just as we can have approximately symmetric, you can also have approximately uniform, where all the bars are not exactly the same height, but they're very, very close to being the same. Okay, so now that we've talked about the five different shapes of graphs, let's look at a really easy kind of graph to make. A dot plot is a really quick way to visualize discrete data. Now, dot plots are supposed to be really easy to make. You don't have to organize the data before you make the graph, and you don't even have two axes. All you need is a horizontal axis on the bottom, and then you're just going to form columns of dots. So let's see this in action. In this example, we've recorded the daily high temperature for Rome, New York for every day in April of 2016. And we're gonna use these values to make a dot plot. If you're interested in weather patterns for various cities, you can go to Weather Underground, which is wunderground.com, and you can type in your zip code or your city name, and it'll find weather information going back for years and years. It's really interesting, and they have not just the temperatures, but they have whether there was a strong event that day, like a snowstorm, or heavy rain, or really high winds, or anything like that. So it's a pretty cool site to navigate. So I'm going to shove the data up to the top of the screen so that we have some space to make our dot plot. The prep work for making a dot plot is super easy. All you need to have is a horizontal axis. Now, in order to label our horizontal axis, we need to have some indication about where to begin and where to end. So I scan through my data and find the smallest value, which in this case is 28 degrees, and I look for the highest value, which is 77. So when I go to label my horizontal axis, I need to make sure that I start at 28 or before, and I end at 77 or above. So I think that if I start at 25 and end at 80, that's going to do the trick. So I'm just going to start labeling. I'm going to count by fives, but you can count by twos or tens or whatever is easier for you. Now, so that I don't forget to label my axis at the end, I'm going to label it now. Each of these values represent temperatures, which are measured in Fahrenheit. So I'm going to label my axis as temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Then to make the dot plot, I just go through my data and I'm going to place a dot where each value is. So for example, let's start with the 66. To graph 66, I'm going to go to where 66 is on the number line and I'm going to place a dot there. Now notice that my dot is hovering slightly above the line. I don't want to put the dot on the line. This isn't a number line, it's an axis, so it's a little bit different. But that's basically what we're going to do for every value. So the next value, if I go down the columns, is 48. So I go to 48 and I place a dot there. Then I go to 77 and I place a dot there. And then when I move to the next column, I get to another 48. So I go to 48, and because there's already a dot there, all I have to do is just put another dot on top of it. 
I think of it as kind of like putting beads in a clear plastic tube or something like that, where you're just stacking items one on top of the other where they belong. So this would be a good time to pause the video and you can create the dot plot on your own. And then when you think you've got it, you can unpause the video and check to see if you've got it right. Okay, so now let's zip through putting all the dots in here. And there we go, this is our dot plot. Now our dot plot is missing just one thing, it needs to have a name. So in this case, these values represent high temperatures that were recorded for Rome, New York in April of 2016. So I'm gonna title my graph, Daily High Temperature in Rome, New York, April 2016. Now I'll point out here, depending on the context of your graph, you may give it a longer or shorter title. For example, if this graph were in a paper about daily high temperatures for Rome, New York, and they were broken down by months, all I'd really have to title this one is April 2016. But because this graph is standing by itself, I want to make sure I give as much detail that's relevant in the title as possible. Alright, so now that we've made our dot plot, let's gather some information from it. For example, what is the shape of this dot plot? Now, as a reminder, the five shapes we talked about were approximately symmetric, skewed to the left, which had a longer tail on the left-hand side, skewed to the right, which had a longer tail on the right-hand side, bimodal, which had two really tall bars or two distinct groupings, and uniform, where all of the bars were about the same height. When I look at our graph of temperatures, what stands out to me are these two really tall bars. Most of the other bars are almost all the same, but these two bars stand out amongst the rest. So because we have two really tall bars, I would classify this shape as bimodal. Now, there's another way that you could look at this graph. For example, you might see this shape when you look at the data. In this case, we have some tall bars kind of close to the center of our graph, and they are pretty much the same height going out towards the left or the right. In other words, if I were to fold this graph down the middle, the two sides would be pretty close to matching up. So, not only is this graph bimodal, but you could also classify it as approximately symmetric. Now, one of the things to bear in mind when you're identifying the shape of a graph is that you don't have to just limit yourself to one shape. In this case, we are both bimodal and approximately symmetric. Okay, let's see what else we can learn from this graph. What was the most frequent daily high temperature in Rome, New York? To answer this, we want to find the tallest column, and that's going to be over here, where we had five dots. So these dots were happening at the temperature of 57 degrees, so 57 degrees was the most frequent daily high temperature in Rome. How many days had a daily high temperature above 70 degrees? To answer this question, we need to count up how many dots are placed to the right of 70. This means we're looking for these dots over here. Since there are 5 dots greater than 70, this means there were 5 days that had a daily high temperature greater than 70 degrees. Also, I want to remind you, whenever you're answering questions, you want to make sure that you're labeling your values whether it's degrees Fahrenheit, number of days, number of categories, whatever values you're giving as an answer, you wanna make sure that you're also labeling. All right, so that's our video about different shapes of graphs and dot plots. In our next video, we'll be examining bar graphs and a special type of bar graph called a Pareto chart. Thanks for watching and have a fantastic day.